Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And again, um, to you, Serene, for organizing this great virtual event. Um, let me just move, rearrange things on my screen here for a sec. Great. So um, we're gonna be talking today about, sorry, let me go back here. We're gonna be, Rihanna and I are going to be discussing um, how to create more humane, healthy and sustainable school menus. And um, so yes, my name is Emily Pickett. I am the campaign director for the Vancouver Humane Society and I manage our plant-based plates program. And Rihanna, I will let her do a sort of intro later, but uh, Rihanna is the campaign manager for Humane Society International Canada. And she manages their um, HSI's forward food program. So both VHS and HSI Canada work to support schools and um, you know, hospitals, restaurants, food service providers in offering more healthy, humane and sustainable plant-based menu options. So we're both really excited to talk to you about our work and ways that you can sort of implement this um, in wherever you are in, in the world and in your community. We're here to support you with that. But before we get into the details of kind of the plant-based plates and the forward food programs, we do kind of want to outline some of the, the key benefits for increasing our consumption of plant-based foods. So for a bit of context, Canadians consume almost 90 kilograms per capita of meat every year, and that's somewhere around 200 pounds. And it's actually among the highest in the world. In fact, I think the global average is somewhere around 40 kilograms per year. So there's lots of room for us to sort of improve on um, kind of the amount of, of animal products and meat that we eat every year. And a growing body of literature, including uh, Canada's recently revised food guide, actually recommends that Canadians shift their consumption to more plant-based foods. And they recommend including um, incorporating plant-based proteins more often as well. And the food guide also acknowledges that many of these uh, the well-studied healthy eating patterns from areas of the world where people statistically live the longest actually include mostly plant-based foods as well. And the dietitians of Canada also note that a plant-based diet can be healthy for anyone from children to teens to older adults. And a well-planned plant-based diet is it's high in fiber, vitamins, antioxidants, while also being low in saturated fat and cholesterol. And it's this sort of healthy combination that also helps to protect against chronic disease as well. So those are sort of kind of the, the health benefits to transitioning our diet and eating more plant-based foods. And meanwhile, our food system also has a major impact on the health of the planet. So food production accounts for nearly a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions. And of those emissions, more than half come from animal products. And in fact, um, animal agriculture is responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than the entire global transportation sector combined. So that's all of the world's planes, trains, cars, ships. Um, and for me, that was a really put that, so put that, put this issue in, into perspective. Um, you know, we talk a lot about environmentally, it's really important to try to carpool when we can, take public transit. Um, impact on the planet. And plant-based foods, on the other hand, um, typically have a smaller environmental footprint than animal-based foods. And research suggests that shifting Western diets toward plant-based eating patterns actually has the potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by up to 70% and land use by 80%. So again, that for me was a really powerful statistic to look at, um, you know, shifting our diet in this way the impact that that can have on emissions and, and on land use. And I think this, um, this image on the screen really kind of captures this entire issue. So on the, the right hand side of that gray dotted line shows sort of the animal based um, resource intensity in terms of land use, freshwater consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. And then on the left hand side of that line is the um, impact of plant based. So pretty significant difference. And shifting our diets and the larger food system toward less animal-based foods and more plant-based is also an opportunity to help protect animal welfare by addressing the rise of intensive animal farming, commonly referred to as factory farming. 
And today's animal agriculture industry is increasingly characterized by large numbers of animals confined in cramped, barren, and unnatural conditions that significantly compromise their welfare and their well being. So, whether it's uh, for animal welfare, sustainability, health, or for other reasons, a growing number of Canadians, and youth in particular, actually, are reducing their consumption of animal products and incorporating more plant-based meals into their diet. So from a food service or school administrator's perspective or, or a teacher's perspective, increasing access to plant-based foods is also important because um, it helps lead to a more inclusive menu with more options that you know, a more um, diverse range of students can enjoy as well. And after all, there are many reasons that someone might opt for a plant-based meal. It could be for ethical reasons, if they, um, they want to be veg, vegan, or they are meat reducing, or for dietary reasons, if they're lactose intolerant, for example, as well as for you know, religious or cultural reasons, among others. So now that we've talked a bit about the um, health, sustainability, and animal welfare benefits of eating more plant-based meals. I'm going to talk about uh, the Vancouver Humane Society's program work in this area. So just a, a really brief intro to VHS. We are a registered charity and um, with the goal of working toward a humane society for all animals. And our campaigns really aim to raise awareness of animal exploitation and to empower individuals, businesses, communities, and governments to be a part of that effort to create a kinder world. Um, and if you sort of tuned into my last talk, you got an idea of kind of the, the whole spectrum of our work. But um, if you didn't, our work sort of ranges on different issues from factory farming to animals and entertainment in captivity to wildlife protection um, and companion animals in need of emergency care as well. So it's quite a range of, of different issues. And since 2015, VHS has supported public institutions throughout uh, Metro Vancouver. That's kind of the main area of our work, um, including schools and hospitals, as well as uh, food service providers in offering more plant-based menu options in their cafeterias. Our new plant-based plates program builds on the success of our um, previous Meatless Monday initiative, which through Meatless Monday, we helped close to 20 secondary and post-secondary schools, as well as hospitals um, in implementing Meatless Monday in, in their institutions. So this is just a, a photo of um, a group of students um, and the team at uh, David Thompson Secondary. They were doing a Meatless Monday event and we have city councilor Adrian Carr there as well. And they were doing some, um, some plant-based milk samplings. And so this was a great way for them to sort of engage with um, their peers while I think the special that day it looked like it was a I think it was a coconut curry dish um, and this was just sort of a great way for them to kind of engage and and kind of educate each other while also kind of creating a exciting way to sort of taste test things and um, chat about the issues and I think it's really helpful to hear about a case study to give you a better sense of sort of what this work looks like in action and a great example of this um, and one that I touched on in my last presentation is the effort by students, staff, and the food service team at Sutherland Secondary in North Vancouver over the last few years. So together they introduced and expanded the number of plant-based menu items that they have in their cafeteria there. And the initial steps for making this happen involved um, VHS supporting Sutherland's, they were called the Meatless Monday Club at the time, they've kind of transitioned to a, a sustainability club name now. Um, so we supported them in reaching out to their school's food service provider, Omega Food, and their school administrators and fellow teachers to propose um, offering Meatless Monday in the cafeteria, which what it sort of took, um, what it looked like in practice was really taking the form of like a, a Meatless Monday special on Mondays. So we didn't, um, we weren't advocating for, you know, taking all of the meat off the menu or anything like that, but it was like, let's highlight a special on the menu today and and kind of create some hype around it, some excitement. Um, and then if students were interested, the goal was to, you know, eventually move these, these items to the regular menu so they could access them more regularly. But this way it kind of added something that they could, they could choose to um, partake in if they wanted. And so with everyone on board, VHS supported the food service provider with kind of their menu planning and their promotion. 
And the club was also really instrumental with menu planning as they were able to kind of help share student feedback and menu ideas with the food service team. So they, through their tabling events, sometimes they would do surveys and kind of engage with, um, with their peers to find out, you know, what would you like on the menu or if they were sampling items, um, you know, did you like this, this sample, would you, what would you change? And that was a really um, sort of invaluable asset to the food service provider as well, because they were getting that direct feedback um, that they could incorporate into their menu. So some of the um, most popular Meatless Monday specials have included a, a lentil vegetable curry with rice, a Mediterranean chickpea curry, a Thai coconut curry, a Mexican bean chili with rice and a crispy tortilla and a Mexican bean burrito. So that sort of answers, uh, Serene had a question in the last presentation. So what sort of dishes were really popular? So I apologize that I, I should have mentioned some of these, but now you know, these were some of the ones that were the most popular in, um, in Sutherland. But I think I mentioned that like the curry dishes have been really popular across a lot of the schools that um, we've seen Meatless Monday or plant-based plates initiated in. And VHS also supported the club with their outreach efforts. So that included, um, you know, the club would do tabling, they would do sampling, as I mentioned. Another great way that they sort of raised awareness and supported participation were through, they would do kind of like Meatless Monday trivia contests, they would do um, PA announcements. Um, and that was a really helpful way to kind of raise awareness among students of just about like the benefits of eating more plant-based foods while also kind of um, highlighting the fact that the cafeteria was having these Meatless Monday specials that they could go and check out if they if they were sort of inspired by. And Sutherland's Meatless Monday initiative has been super popular and it led to um, students asking for the Meatless Monday specials to be added to that regular daily menu that they have set. And I mean that's our ultimate goal. That was just the best news to hear that you know the students were really enjoying the, these meals so much that they wanted them to be on the regular menu. Um, and that's something that we're working to support that food service provider in doing now through our new plant-based plates program. And that's kind of why we shifted it is to, you know, Meatless Monday was a great way to sort of um, let, introduce the concept to, to students and to people. And now, you know, the goal is really like, how can we, how can we um, help students and staff and everyone just have access to these foods on a regular basis. But Meatless Monday is also a great way for, I think for food service providers to just kind of um, test out the water, try some new options and, um, and see what works. And the goal of plant-based plates sort of as I got a bit ahead of myself there is to really just build on Meatless Monday and help kind of meet that growing demand for healthy, humane and sustainable plant-based options and to ultimately improve that student access to those options on the daily menu. And so through this new kind of phase of the program, we encourage food service teams to to set a target for their plant-based menu offerings. So for example, that could be setting a goal of say 20% of their daily entrees, um, making those plant-based. And from our end, we offer free resources, including uh, presentations, recipes, marketing materials, um, menu planning best practices. And we've done some custom sort of culinary workshops for food service teams as well. And I think those have been really great because it sort of helps um, because they're sort of customized, we're able to work with them and in um, what is their sort of unique situation and how can we help them um, tweak their menu and, and add these options. And so this photo is actually a guest chef pop-up that we did um, at the BC Children's and Women's Hospital with um, guest chef Andrea Potter from Rooted Nutrition. And this was a really great sort of um, outreach event that we did because it sort of featured, it was, it was a training in the morning for the staff on these particular dishes but then also kind of a guest chef pop-up at lunch to sort of um, like a public facing guest chef pop-up so that people that were coming into the cafeteria could sort of, it was a, this little event happening and they could sample the items and if they enjoyed them, they could purchase the full item. And so it was a, a great success and that's something we um, hope to do more of in the future when, uh, yeah, when we can do that after COVID hopefully. Um, and we've held several culinary workshops to help food service teams build on their plant-based cooking skills um, and to try out these different recipes, including Canada's first forward food culinary training, which we organized in partnership with HSI Canada. And that was an amazing event. Um, you know, and, and HSI has done a, a bunch more of those types of events 
And so Rihanna can tell you more about that. And in the midst of um, COVID-19, VHS, like many others, we've, you know, we've had to shift some of our strategies and, and approaches, and we're working to make more of our resources available online, which um, will allow food service providers, school administrators, um, students, teachers, and parents as well, um, allow them to kind of access those tools at their convenience. And that's something that we plan to kind of continue to still offer um, hopefully when things improve and we can still um, you know, be in person at events and whatnot, we still wanna be able to offer these resources online so that um, people can kind of access them in person or online, whatever really works for them. And we'll talk more at the end of the presentation about uh, you know, specific tips for implementing more plant-based menu options. But that kind of wraps up, um, yeah, the, our kind of plant-based plates program. So um, if you would like to chat about introducing more plant-based options at your school or daycare or elsewhere in the community, um, in your community, I would love for you to get in touch with me at emily at Vancouver Humane Society bc.ca and you can also check um, our website out at for more information at vancouverhumane.ca and now I will hand it over to Rihanna to talk about HSI's forward food program. Thank you Emily I will start sharing my screen and hopefully you can <laughs> make sure that I'm sharing mine fine too. <clears throat> okay how does that look? That looks good to me yes. Perfect. Thank you. And yeah, thanks for that great um, first half of our presentation. And Serene, thank you again for organizing. Um, and thanks to all of the people listening for uh, taking time out of your day to um, check out this presentation. So yeah, as Emily mentioned, I'm a campaign manager with Humane Society International Canada, and I lead our farm animal welfare campaigns, um, which includes running our forward food program, which I will tell you a bit about now. So if you haven't heard of forward food, or sorry, if you haven't heard of HSI Canada, I should start with. Um, we are a national animal protection organization. We work on a wide variety of issues in a wide variety of ways. So we do education, um, advocacy related work. We do direct care for animals sometimes. Uh, we also do a lot of work on developing science or policies or legislation or that kind of thing. Um, we work in a variety of different areas. So whether it's wildlife protection, uh, working to protect marine life, um, trying to implement better laws and standards and practices for animals that are used in testing or research or in clothing, um, re rescuing animals from natural disasters, for example. Um, we do a lot of work with companion animals, whether it's um, trying to end really cruel practices towards dogs and cats or you know, helping stray animals to receive veterinary care that they may not otherwise get. Um, and then of course, we do a lot of work on farm animal welfare and that's where my role comes in. So. Um, I spend about half of my time working with government bodies or standard setting or legislative um, bodies and issues and food companies to help them implement better practices and standards and laws and regulations for farm animals so that, you know, when we have many, many, many animals in our food system, um, they're treated as humanely as possible. And then also running our forward food program, which is working with institutions and businesses to help them add more of the, you know, compassionate, sustainable healthy plant-based meals that Emily was talking about. So if you haven't heard about our forward food program prior to today, um, it's very similar to the plant-based plates program. So it's a culinary resource program that helps food service professionals, whether they're you know, primarily chefs, but also dietitians or food service managers or directors or people who um, do food prep or create menus or whatnot, food purchasing, anyone in that kind of space, whether they are at um, educational institutions or healthcare facilities or restaurants or other kinds of businesses like food service providers or food service management companies, food distributors even. Um, we provide them with culinary trainings, we provide them with recipes and menu development support. Um, we can help with marketing and communications, uh, providing educational sessions and content. Uh, and we can also do greenhouse gas assessments to help um, institutions measure the changes that come with menu changes. So for example, if they uh, one year, you know, transition a lot of their menu options to be more plant-based, which is a lot more sustainable, as Emily talked about. You know, we can look at the greenhouse gas emission changes that happen as a result of those menu changes to be really, uh, really help to make the sustainability case or show the sustainability benefits and be part of 
an organization or a company sustainability story, since that is a, a driving force why a lot of people are serving and looking for more of these options. Um, and so we, like I said, we will do a wide variety of services. This is just a, a photo of, you know, culinary training that we did, for example, with Sheridan College um, last summer. And as Emily mentioned, you know, we, we launched this program in Canada in 2017. That was our first um, event in Canada that we hosted in collaboration with BHS. And it really was born out of the recognition that not only is there this growing demand for plant-based options for the reasons Emily talked about, right? Whether it comes to sustainability or health or compassion, or also, um, you know, food costs can be one of the reasons why people add more plant-based options. They can often be a lot more affordable. You know, it's, it's a no brainer that things like beans and legumes and lentils are a lot cheaper typically than animal protein. Um, and so it was come out of, or it came out of the recognition that there's a growing demand for those kinds of options, but at the same time, not a lot of food service professionals and chefs particularly have ever had training in how to create really great, you know, vegetarian or vegan options, plant-based options that really put vegetables or fruit or grains at the center of the plate. You know, typically the way that culinary courses have been taught is to put animal products at the center of the plate and fruits and vegetables and things are kind of an afterthought or a, a side event or um, just, you know, an accompaniment rather than the main show. So we really um, designed this program to be a resource that covers kind of any, any needs, any skills that, that could be developed in food service professionals who maybe haven't had any of that custom training before. So we make a lot of different dishes. Uh, we have a wide variety of recipes. Um, this is just a sample of some of our different uh, dishes that we train people how to make. So for example, there's a nacho cheese sauce that's dairy-free, of course, uh, a mushroom street taco, crabless crab cakes, and a carrot also buco. So obviously these are some of these are a little bit fancier in some ways, but um, and they wouldn't all necessarily always be appropriate for a cafeteria menu, but what we strive to do in the recipes that we provide is create recipes that are A, um, you know, really accessible in terms of using widely available ingredients and that are typically not very expensive. So using a lot of whole foods or, you know, fresh ingredients rather than processed items, which can be a bit more expensive um, and that are very easy to follow. So, you know, no matter what the skill set is of the people who are making these dishes, it's usually not a problem. Um, and that they're adaptable and customizable. So we've seen some of these recipes or items be adapted into menus ac across different settings. So whether it's a, you know, a casual, fast, um, quick service kind of restaurant setting versus like a gala or a catering department at a school or a school cafeteria, there's a lot of variety in the ways that these, these ideas and these techniques and these recipes can be implemented and added to different menus. Um, and our culinary trainings are one of the most popular things that we offer for sure in terms of our services. Uh, of course, right now with COVID, we haven't been able to do any recently, but typically how they work is we spend two days in a kitchen with a food service team running through a wide variety of recipes, usually from covering from breakfast all the way through dessert. Um, and it's a really great chance for people to get to try making the recipes themselves. So, you know, different food service professionals, chefs and um, cooks and anyone else who's involved in food preparation. Um, and giving them a chance to try new methods and maybe encounter some ingredients that they otherwise wouldn't come across um, and getting to, you know, see how these things in taste, of course, and then brainstorm how they could fit into their own menus. Um, and as Emily mentioned, you know, what we're trying to do is make it easier for people to add more plant-based options to their menus and we encourage people to set a target. So everything that we provide is free of charge, just like the plant-based plates uh, resources that Emily was talking about. But what we ask for in exchange is that the people that we're working with commit to some kind of measurable change to make their food system uh, more sustainable and more humane and more um, healthy. So what we recommend is, or ask people to do is sign the forward food pledge, which is very similar to, um, you know, the example Emily gave of, you know, for example, say transitioning 20% of a menu to be plant-based. So if, an institution or a school or a hospital or something is that, you know, 30% of their menu is plant-based, we would work with them to get that up to 50% so that they can access all of our resources for free while at the same time making a meaningful yet achievable contribution to building a better food system. Um, and we do have a lot of resources available on our website, of course, as well, that are all uh, available for download for free. So that's the URL, that's friendsofhsi.ca slash issue slash forward dash food. Um, and we have things like recipes on there, 
that are designed for high volume cooking specifically. Um, and again, very accessible ingredients, uh, industry toolkits. So, you know, best practice or guidance or sample menus or marketing tips or that kind of thing. Um, as well as we have a vendor list of plant-based vendors that we know exist in Canada that are selling a range of products, whether it's uh, plant-based meats or proteins or non-dairy cheeses or you know, egg-free products and that kind of thing. So that might be a helpful resource. I encourage you to check that out if that's useful. Um, and now I'm gonna spend the rest of the time just quickly touching base about uh, some tips for providing more plant-based options. So I think we don't have as much time as I expected. So I'll run through this a little quickly, but um, also happy to chat more about it afterwards. So essentially when it comes to adding more plant-based options, there are a lot of things that I think we see that are not always done as successfully as they could be done and that you know don't have the sales that you would expect. And essentially we wanna make sure that plant-based foods sound good, look good, are normalized and are promoted and incentivized. And that sounds all very straightforward, but I'll give you some examples of what that looks like. So in terms of sounding good, you know, there was this article from NPR a few years ago that was really talking about consumers need to feel like we're focusing more on flavor and mouthfeel and providence to really make foods that are crave worthy and that are making people's mouths water. And that's what will get people to choose more plant-based options rather than the fact that they're healthy or sustainable. Those are important, but not what makes a food crave worthy. So to just give you a quick example, you know, would you rather have something called vegan zucchini bites or slow roasted caramelized zucchini bites? I think the last one, the second one sounds a lot more appealing, right? Same thing here, butternut squash with rice and greens, very basic label, or roasted butternut squash stewed in a sweet and spicy coconut curry with fresh Thai basil. You know, that sounds again, a lot more appealing. Um, or a low fat vegetarian black bean soup versus a Cuban black bean soup. Again, the second one sounded more appealing and it's actually a real life example. So this is from Panera and they had 18 locations that um, for a month long test, they changed the name from low fat vegetarian black bean soup to Cuban black bean soup. And that's the only thing that they changed. And that alone resulted in sales increasing by 13% just because it had a better name. The recipe and the dish were the same. The same thing has been found in other studies. So this is uh, information from the World Resources Institute, which is a great resource if you haven't seen them before. But essentially they found that diners are much more likely to choose dishes with more indulgent names, such as rich buttery roasted sweet corn, rather than items with a healthy restrictive label. So something like low fat or low sodium, or just a basic label that is just in, contains no descriptions. And this is true in other settings too. So in retail, for example, there was a study of um, a retail product in the UK and they tested out different names rather than calling something uh, meat-free sausage and mash. They tried field-grown sausages and mash, Cumberland spiced veggie sausages and mash, and better sausages and mash. And you can see that the one that had the most description, Cumberland spiced, uh, had significantly higher uh, sales. And so typically you'd want to avoid words like meat-free, vegan, vegetarian, or labels that are considered healthy restrictive. So again, like low sodium or low fat. Um, and use items like provenance or, or use descriptions that refer to where a dish comes from or how it tastes or how it looks and feels. And then when it comes to um, making things look good, of course, this goes without saying, you know, we, we often eat with our eyes before we eat any other way. But again, these are real life examples that <clears throat> I've seen in terms of veg options or plant-based options that are done really well versus that are not um, done as well as I think they could be. So obviously the second one here looks a lot more appealing. The same is true here for a sandwich. You know, you could have um, something a little bit more plain and, and boring on the one hand or something a bit more exciting and really satisfying and crave worthy on the other. Both are plant-based. Um, and then dessert, of course, is an area where I think uh, there aren't as many plant-based options all the time. It's typically fruit if there is nothing else available. Um, but you can have some really great, delicious, appealing plant-based options that people wouldn't even know are plant-based when it comes to desserts. Um, and this is important because taste is a really strong reason why people will choose plant-based options. So even though, you know, we know that people make these choices for environmental health or ethical reasons, they still are driven primarily by taste. So if a dish doesn't look or taste good, people are just not going to choose it unless they are very strictly following a specific type of diet. And that's a smaller portion of the population than the flexitarians or the people who are looking for more variety for the reasons that Emily talked about. And so when it comes to making things taste good, some tips are to use meat eaters as the taste testers. So, you know, people who are omnivores or people who are flexitarians, because you want this dish to be appealing to people who are not just the strict vegetarians or plant-based eaters, like vegans, whoever they are. 
Um, it should be something that everyone's going to find delicious. So have everybody test it. Um, you can also look to popular restaurants and blogs for inspiration. Of course, there's so many plant-based options everywhere now, and they're very exciting. And it's a great um, resource that we have to be able to draw from. Um, and then some schools or some businesses will have a specific person who's in charge of creating and um, you know, tailoring plant-based meals or creating plant-based menus um, because that person can really dive into it and dedicate some time to making their options really good. So that's not possible for everybody, but it is an option. Um, and just to give you a couple of examples from different schools. So we've worked with the University of Waterloo and they have an all plant-based um, station or concept that they launched a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago, I believe. And you know, to give you some examples, they really are having good feedback because they have things like eggplant bacon or smoked tofu or Korean crispy chickpeas. And they're getting feedback that there's so many good choices that students actually just don't know what to choose because there's so much. And it's really, they've really focused on good flavor. Um, and then similarly at the University of Ottawa where we've worked, they have a plant-based um, station in their all-you-can-eat dining or all-you-care-to-eat dining hall. Um, and they, again, designed all of the meals and menus for that keeping both vegetarians and vegans and omnivores in mind, knowing that they want these dishes to appeal to everybody. And then when it comes to normalizing them, this is also really important because historically, and I think this has changed a lot in the last few years, but historically the plant-based options or the vegetarian options or the vegan options were the special options that you had to request or seek out specifically. Um, but more and more we're seeing them become normalized and just be part of you know, a regular menu that are, it's, it's accessible for everybody, it's there for everybody who wants it. And to give you an example of what's been shown in the research is that having the vegetarian items or vegan items separated out on menu can make them much more likely, much less likely to be ordered. So for example, the London School of Economics did this study where the vegetarian options were integrated into a regular menu versus called out in their own ca category as a vegetarian dish section. And they were 56% less likely to be ordered when they were in that separate section. I think that's because if you don't identify as a vegetarian and you see this menu, then you're probably just gonna exclude that section of the menu because you're not gonna see it as being there for you. Whereas if those options are just presented as regular options, you're more likely to consider them and order them. The same thing is true with specials. So, you know, daily specials or chef specials or whatever item is being promoted. If you make that your plant-based option, that's not only normalizing it, but also promoting it a bit and making it known that that's there for everybody. Um, and this is how the University of Ottawa has done it at their station. So Pure is this plant-based station. It's not labeled as vegan or anything. It's just, you know, real fresh, flavorful food. And it's one of many options that students can choose from, but it is in a central place in their cafeteria. And they're getting, they think it accounts for, last I checked with them, about 14% of all of their food consumed in their very large 24-7 uh, all-you-care-to-eat dining hall, which is much more than they expected, but because it's good, accessible, widely available food that you don't have to go seeking out specially. Um, and so some suggestions for integrating your meals are keeping the food in line with the style that you already serve so that it fits well with your menu, then you can use ingredients that you typically source on hand. You do always wanna have a center of the plate protein um, or plant-based proteins on hand to be able to make items uh, vegan capable or plant-based capable. And you typically wanna have meals be complete without requiring extensive modifications because if you have a, a meal that is plant-based but requires a lot of modifications, you don't really have a meal that's plant-based, you have a meal that's plant-capable, which is good, but the idea is to have things that are readily available. And lastly, there's a lot you can do to incentivize and promote your plant-based options. So for example, plant-based is a trendy topic right now. The media will often report on it if a school or an institution or a business is doing more to offer plant-based options. So you can try to leverage the media. Um, events are a great way to get the word out. So we've helped schools or, or places to host, you know, themed dinners or galas or fancy things like that, or tastings, or the kinds of things that Emily was talking about, even ta tabling and getting students involved and providing feedback is really important. Um, social media is a great place to showcase some of these items too, especially because plant-based dishes typically have so much color. They photograph really well. They can be very, you know, quote unquote, Instagrammable. So if you have a social media place or a website where you can put these online, that can be great. Um, and then of course you can have posters or whatnot up in school, highlighting some of the benefits, you know, for fueling up with fruits and veggies, for example, or promoting some of the things that students might find in your cafeteria so that when they get to the cafeteria, it's familiar and they have some sort of, you know, comfort level with it and maybe even some knowledge about why it's good for them and maybe they'll be more likely to choose it. Um, and so you can tease new menu items, offer free samples, visibly promote them on your premise with signs. You can host events, like I said, engage the media, 
take advantage of digital marketing, including newsletters. Um, and then make sure that your staff is really engaged too. And this goes back to something Emily was saying, you know, having that dialogue with the people who are actually preparing that food and making sure that they see the benefits of offering more of these things can be really powerful since they're typically gonna be the ones who are serving them to students and asking and answering questions. Um, and really, if they believe in it, I think their students, your students are more likely to choose those options as well. So if you have any questions, we'd be happy to take them now. Emily and I can uh, be available for the Q&A, but you're also welcome to contact me afterwards if you wanna chat about anything that I said in more detail or take advantage of our services. Thank you so much, both of you. That was amazing. Um, yeah, let's see if there's any questions. Anybody have any questions, please put them in the Q&A right now. <clears throat> Sorry. I just have to figure out how to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> let's oh, take them. Yeah. So much fun. Um, yeah, and so just to be clarify, just to clarify, Emily works with Vancouver Humane and mainly focuses on Lower Mainland here in Vancouver area. And Rihanna works with Humane Society International Canada. And so if anybody is in any other provinces or across the uh, rest of Canada, you can contact her um, regarding any cafeteria or food change programs, <laughs> adding more plant-based options to schools and work environments. So um, I really, really appreciate you both coming on here um to do this presentation today and Emily especially for doing two um and um yeah and I guess there doesn't seem to be any other questions but you both were great and put your information out there so if anybody can reach out to you directly um, we also have links on the website to your social medias so if people want to reach out to you through there that's great too um but yeah thank you so much again thank you yeah thanks for having us and for organizing no, anytime and hope you both have a great day further. You too. Thank Thanks. You.